This is Digital Pathology Today. Now here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. NVIDIA has launched Cambridge One, a powerful new supercomputer in the UK. NVIDIA, as we know, is involved in computer graphics, artificial intelligence, computing, and processors across a variety of industries, including gaming, entertainment, finance, as well as healthcare. What are the commonalities of these industries and what lessons can we learn from other fields and apply them to healthcare? Welcome to Digital Pathology Today. I'm Joe Anderson. Our guest is Craig Rhodes, EMEA Industry Lead for Artificial Intelligence, Healthcare, and Life Sciences at NVIDIA. We're going to be talking about supercomputing and artificial intelligence. There's the perception that healthcare lags behind other industries in terms of AI applications. And who better to talk to than Craig will clarify this. Is this true or is it a misconception? How is AI changing healthcare now and in the future? How can we accelerate the adoption of artificial intelligence and new technologies? NVIDIA has launched Cambridge One. What is this going to mean for healthcare? What are the opportunities? Who's going to benefit? And what results do we think this new supercomputer is going to make in the lives of patients? Craig Rhodes from NVIDIA, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is exciting to have you. NVIDIA is involved uh, in computer graphics, artificial intelligence, and processors across a variety of industries. Too many to name, but gaming, entertainment, finance, healthcare. Uh, so I think it's, you know, so someone like me, it's fascinating. And maybe tell us what commonalities these industries have, what lessons you've learned along the way, and, and how can we apply these lessons to healthcare? Yeah, so I think as we've uh, as we've seen the evolution of Nvidia and the graphical cards for gaming, we've seen a lot of commonalities in areas like autonomous driving and healthcare. Actually, are two really good examples of that. So where we're looking for object detection and the autonomous driving, looking you know from a car's perspective, trying to identify particular objects um, that are, you know coming across its windshield. With the same as healthcare, where we might be looking at an X-ray image, doing a similar sort of thing. There's many, many um, kind of commonalities, and one thing that we've learned is to be able to share across our different industries at Nvidia, and it's really exciting when we see an advancement in one industry to then look at that and see how we could reuse that in our own kind of industry. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's fascinating, and in particular, digital pathology, which are, which is our focus here. I mean, not to make light of it or, you know, take away from the seriousness of what we do, but there is certainly kind of like a, you know, the pathologist sitting in the cockpit looking at the screen, you know, I mean, it is somewhat enjoyable, but there's kind of, you know, there's kind of a gaming quality to it. And and certainly what we're dealing with is images and humans interacting with the images and the graphics. And I, I find it uh, completely fascinating, but there's this perception and maybe it's just a perception or is it a reality that, you know, healthcare and maybe even pathology in particular kind of lags behind other industries, particularly in consumer tech, in terms of adopting new technologies and AI applications. Is this true or is this just a misconception? Yeah, I, I actually think it's a misconception, um, but maybe that's because I'm kind of deeply embedded and, um, you know, love it a bit. So I think we, we've really seen AI advance in healthcare in many places around the world and actually take the lead um, in those places as well. If we look at areas like pathology, we're doing something that not many other industries, big industries are, are doing, is taking very, very large images and trying to identify all of the different intricate artifacts on that image and start to predict what they may be and then what may happen. And this is, you know, this is very, very forward thinking AI um, that we have. So I actually think healthcare, it, it, you know, is a really kind of ahead of the game. If you look at areas like federated learning, this idea of keeping data where it is, where it is like in hospitals, rather than having to pull it all together. The healthcare domain really drove that kind of technology because of the challenges around moving healthcare data around. So I think because of the security and ethical issues we have in healthcare, we have to find some really interesting solutions and techniques to overcome those challenges. And usually that means being really innovative and that then drives the market and the demand for that. And we're actually seeing 
the banking sector, the financial um, sector, start to look at the healthcare sector and, and look at what we're doing and start to adopt some of those techniques. So I would say in some cases, actually, we're, we're really ahead of the game in healthcare for what, you know, and this is, you know, this is really for once with big healthcare IT programs. Going back to that point about overlap, there certainly is a lot of overlap between other industries and privacy, I think is a huge concern in healthcare and of course in, in banking. So I, I can kind of see the synergies there. And then uh, it's interesting that you're alluding to, you know, we're doing something somewhat unique in healthcare too, in that when we interact with these images and data, you know, we're trying to extract the features, but then to add a predictive and prognostic component, we're looking at what is there, what features are there, and then how can we extract and learn and then make predictions about what is going to happen to the patient associated with these data. So I think it's 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 a very exciting and somewhat unique application in healthcare, I would say. So maybe before we go any further, I think we, you kind of opened up a lot for us there to talk about, such as uh, privacy and, and things like that. But maybe let's take a step back and maybe give like a loose overview of what AI is just in general and how is it how is it affecting healthcare now and in the in the future you know i think ai in healthcare is really helping to start looking at some of the strains that we see on the healthcare system and no you know of course in in this day and age with the pandemic there are many many challenges but those challenges we've always had it's just that the strain is even heavier now and that, that might be patient patient workflow and patients flowing through the hospital, being able to diagnose patients fast enough and the kind of reduction in the kind of the staff that we've got, like the nurses, the radiologists, so staffing. So that there are many challenges within healthcare that AI is now starting to really benefit. And so that's how we've kind of positioned AI initially, is to look at those big challenges whether it's you know the influx of data, whether it's you know short of staff, whether it's trying to um, diagnose um, or support the diagnosis process, we try to take those as the starting points so that we can really help to inform AI and healthcare together. So we're not we're not trying to build something that nobody needs currently at the moment. I think that where that's leading us to, to is to go to go and start doing more and more advanced things. And some of the work that we're doing in genetics is, is, is kind of getting there and some of the work we're doing in drug discovery. But I think we've, we've started in, you know, I don't want to kind of belittle it, but simple AI where we're looking at positives, where we're looking at negatives, where we're look at identifying artifacts, where we're trying to flow patients through a hospital by identifying which ones are urgent, which ones are not, not so urgent. But underneath it all, underpinning it all, is always the clinical decision-making process from you know, the consultants, the doctors, the nurses. So this is supportive information rather than information that's taking over that process. So it's you know we've we've really tried to start from the basics and from there kind of gain get more and more complex. Yeah, I think we certainly are starting to solve very practical problems, and I think yeah, I agree that the pandemic's kind of given us a real shot in the arm or kind of brought these problems to a finer point. And I think there's different considerations depending on your geography, but you know I think Europe is a little bit ahead in the game in terms of adopting. Uh, these systems that can facilitate workflow, but then also we've heard that they maybe had higher pain points in terms of backlogs of cases, you know, patients waiting an unacceptable amount of time to get their biopsy results. And I think AI solutions can certainly go a long way, you know, by enhancing the workflow just, you know, to increase turnaround time, you know, not to belittle that, like you said, but at the very least, you know, kind of pick the low-hanging fruits and how we can come in and, yeah. and make a difference. So you talked about privacy, uh, and that seems to be a big concern. So how do, how do we go about handling issues there? So firstly, I think you've got to have the clinical teams really supporting, at taking the lead of any of these kind of, uh, any of these AI programs. So I think that's the first point. They're the ones that understand the patient, the requirements around that patient. Um, and the data that they need to be able to, you know, um, provide the best diagnosis for that patient. And as part of that, we need to pr follow the right ethical process to collect the data um, and support that um, process. 
So I think, you know, uh, the privacy of the data and the privacy of the AI system should always be following the exact same process as if the AI system wasn't there. So, you know, it, it is quite complex because, you know, what we don't want the, um, the consultants to feel is that this is some kind of black box solution. We, we do need to be, ensure that it's explainable. We are looking as well at different types of techniques. I talked about federated learning. This is an idea of being able to build your algorithms and models in the hospital rather than to have to pull all of the data into some kind of large data lake. Not to say that doing that data lake is, is the wrong answer. It's, it's just another technique depending on the security requirements of your data. So I think it's imperative to have the clinicians, the clinical teams leading programs like this and then identifying the real hotspots where I think, you know, patient privacy and the data that uh, goes alongside that, where we're using it, how we're using it, how we explain it, all of that has to be grouped together. So it's, it's hugely important. But, it, you know, we don't want to step outside of, you know, the current ethical process that we already go through when collecting data, putting it on our EHR systems, EMR systems as well. Yeah. So when you talk about uh, ethical considerations uh, surrounding AI and advanced computing, it seems like there's kind of two broad categories. One is people have concern with data, right? There's large amounts of data flying around, uh, you know, hopefully being used in the appropriate way with the appropriate consents and not being leaked or shared with unauthorized parties. And then kind of related to that is, you know, the black box, which you mentioned, where you know, this is way too complicated for any human being, particularly a physician or a pathologist who really doesn't, is not a programmer and doesn't really know how this stuff works, you know, but they, but they're ne by necessity going to be interacting with it and using it. So how do we get the users, the physicians and other, you know, he healthcare workers uh, to become more comfortable, you know, with maybe the black box effect or the lack of transparency? Yeah, so great question. A, um, education and training. So that's a priority for them to understand how we're building these algorithms, um, how they're being developed. And then secondly, they have to be involved in the process. So ultimately, when we're bu building an algorithm, let's say for a breast cancer, we still need the, um, you know, the radiologist annotating those images. Now, as part of that process, what we don't want to just do is give the radiologist a thousand images and say, go annotate them. What we want to do is explain exactly what this process is and when they're annotating those images, what does it mean? How are we iterating over the work and then showing them how the system is learning so that they can see themselves as part of the process. Oh, OK, well, the next round we iterate, the system is getting more right and so on. So they have to be a very early on in the journey and then integral to the key um, kind of points in time where that algorithm is being developed. So the black box doesn't become a black box. It becomes a very transparent box to those people. And of course, what we want them to do at the end of the day is also if a patient wants to be informed about you know, how their care is being managed, that, that consultant, that radiologist, the consultant, the pathologist, they can also talk about, you know, how AI is, you know, being introduced into their care as well. So them having that education and training up front, but then integrally involved in that process um, should make the process much, much more transparent. Yeah, I, I like that. We kind of can turn this black box into, into a transparent box. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And so, you know, then I think the next question is, you know, what about the regulatory concerns? I think, you know, that's, I think that's another area where people may be a little uncomfortable or how do you even go about regulating something that, you know, or approving something for general use that has the perception of not being transparent or is, you know, we do our best to make it transparent, but it's just so complicated you know that it's hard it's hard to explain and hard to get approval or or when we move into this area of ai there's the suggestion that this could be something that's continuously evolving with with machine learning that it's not locked down or it's locked down at some level but you know maybe there's not agreement on on what exactly that means so how do we look at regulation is it a, a hindrance that's you know we have to overcome or is it we have to 
take on a new approach to regulation to you know maybe work in more see you know the various bodies as more partners you know to help us bring these new technologies to market yeah i think certainly the latter i think what we've seen with the regulation is still somewhat instilled in the medical device kind of space where you know you're building something physical it's got physical components to it and each one of those components is coming from somewhere has to have a quality check towards them i think we need to you know obviously we're still retaining that because there's still medical devices but we do need a kind of a fresh look at what we're doing in the space of ai because as you say these things are iterating very very quickly and if we're getting you know say we're getting a new data set from you know of lung cancer images you know for us to then retrain the model bring more knowledge into that particular algorithm that might be used in care but then have to still go through a you know a 12 to 18 month regulatory process would kind of slow down this whole evolution of ai so i think we have to be careful that the regulations are not slowing down the innovations that are coming out of AI. But we do, of course, still have to ensure that we're complying to those regulations, uh, uh, those demands of the regulators. Now, things like uh, running um, parallel projects. So, you know, we're still doing, you know, our traditional point of care, working on the patient. But alongside that, we've got the AI system so that we are almost simulating what the AI system would do in the, in, you know, in real care uh, and checking, see where it works, see where it might need to be tweaked. And actually, interestingly, there's a startup um, company called Chiron Medical. They work in breast cancer. And this is very similar to what they've done previously. They have somebody looking at a mammograph, um, a consultant, and then they have the AI system alongside or making that determination of a positive and negative. But then you've got the stop gap as well. So you still got that human interaction to ensure that, you know, if as a fail safe, if the um, system seems to have got it wrong and needs retraining, that there's some, a human to intervene into that process as well. I think we can get more slicker with our processes, but I do think the regulators I've got to kind of speed up. And we have seen some of that with the FDA um, changes. There are some ways of working alongside research and clinical care together. But again, that, you know, we could always speed up regulators. Yeah, yeah I think we're, we're hitting somewhat of an inflection point, I think, or at least that's my view. And, you know, I think historically the view has been that regulation just by necessity lags technology and like you said, the uh, the old model, maybe with devices and drugs, was that you know you would put a lot into developing a new drug or, or product, and you would have copyright and patent issues, and you'd have a certain amount of time to recoup your investment. But basically, you would want that thing to work forever, and it's going to be the standard for the yeah. indefinite future. But now it's a completely different model, where kind of the expectation is thing we're going to get better, and things are going to continuously improve and. In- improve and evolve. And we know that the way we look at a mammogram today is probably not going to be the same way we do it in five years from now. And hopefully, you know, people people are on board in the, with this new way of doing things. Absolutely. So speaking of which, NVIDIA is launching Cambridge One, which is some, some big news, a powerful supercomputer in the UK. So maybe tell us, you know, just what is Cambridge One? What is this? What is a supercomputer? Give us a little details on the project. Yes. We, NVIDIA decided to invest in supercomputing facilities here in the UK to really advance healthcare research. One of the great things that we've seen about um, seen within the UK is the collaboration with um, some of our key customers, people like AstraZeneca, um, GSK, Oxford Nanopore, Guys and St. Thomas's and the NHS in general, King's College London and NVIDIA, and really working together on some big problems and challenges. With that, as well as with COVID, Jensen, our CEO, wanted to really push forward the supercomputing agenda. So he's made um, the investment and NVIDIA's made the investment into putting the largest supercomputer into the UK, so the largest supercomputer in the UK. And this is a, you know, a very, very large um, computer being driven by our DGX systems and our A100 uh, GPUs and some very, very fast storage from DDN, 
It's got all of our latest um, networking from Mellanux, et cetera. And, and it's really there to take some fundamentally challenging either scientific or clinical problems and really take them and scale them enormously. Um, and actually, one project recently from King's College London, we've just, um, a couple of weeks ago, we, we did a press release around that, and there's a lovely video um, from that where King's talk about this idea of building synthetic brain images to advance research in areas like Alzheimer's or um, MS or stroke and so on. And actually what they've taken is the brain image data from UK Biobank, which is kind of inverted commas, normal brain images, and then taken the disease brain images from guys in St. Thomas's and brought those together so that you've got an algorithm that's able to produce millions of variants of diseased or normal brains that you can use to really kickstart your research in kind of neurological areas. So this is just fundamentally life-changing work that's gone on. Now, if we, if we didn't have Cambridge One, you know, we would churn through this, um, this, these data sets, building these algorithms probably in a year, two years. In two to three months, we've been able to build a very, very good algorithm and we're going to get that algorithm to be better and better and better so that the quality of the images that are being produced you could not determine that these were synthetically created and actually we did a, a post George Cardoso the CTO did a post to, to just check people and put some images uh, and we actually found that people really couldn't determine the synthetic images versus the real images and this is, and they are releasing this to the open source community. So again, a fantastic gesture from King's College London and guys in St. Thomas's, but also bringing together that supercomputing type facilities to really do this at high speed, at enormous accuracy. We're doing the same in drug discovery. Uh, we're going to be doing the same in genetics and so on. So we, we want to be also on the cusp of a real change in health research where we bring supercomputing and some of the biggest challenges in healthcare together uh, and we try and do something fantastically different. Oh, wow. That is, that is fantastically different. Synthetic images, that's incredible. And then reducing computing times or the times involved, compressing that from years and months to, to months and days even. That's, that's incredible. Do you think synthetic images is going to be a possibility in digital pathology? Yes. Um, so actually, uh, th that's probably going to be one of the projects that we'll be looking at in the near future as well. So there's some fantastic pathology projects going on in the UK. Probably one of the biggest in Europe, possibly the world, is the Path Lake project uh, led by the Dr. David Sneed and Nazir Rajput, so Professor Nazir, Nazir Rajput, looking at areas like colorectal cancer, lung cancer, but they're starting to collect, you know, not thousands of Im images, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of images. And you can imagine, you know, if we can get hundreds of thousands of images around colorectal cancer, the accuracy of that model and the importance of that model to be able to start differentiating very small variations in images and being able to feed new images from patients, possibly patients in late stage, and start to look at the variations. You know, that's the great thing or the big challenge with pathology images, A, the size, but the complexity of the artifact. So if we, you know, if we bring many hundreds of thousands of images together, this system learns fantastically well what those artifacts are and also the cause of those artifacts. Okay, wow. I mean, that's incredible. I think if you ask most pathologists, could you even imagine such a thing yes. a, a few years ago where right? you get a blank stare? Like you said, doing there's many, many challenges in doing research, image-based research in pathology, not the least of which is you know, how the tissue is handled, the fixation artifacts, the H&E staining variability, you have the appropriate mix of cases from the right patients, and then just the sheer numbers. So the idea is to 
enhance the size of the collection. So let's say maybe you, in the best case scenario in the real world, you could have a set of maybe a thousand cases, 1,000 to 5,000 cases. I think that's pretty much about as much data as anyone has ever looked at in a, in a pathology study. But you're saying we could synthetically derive or engineer cases taking various features and correlating that with clinical outcomes to increase the, the, the number of patients, so to speak, in a study many, many, many more fold and then bring to bear all of this massive computing power. Is that the approach? Yes. And also what some of these big projects are doing, like Path Lake, but there's also the European one, Big Picture, they're actually the, just the quantity. And I know um, you know, the adoption of digital pathology across the world has been very varied. The UK and parts of Europe have really kind of kick-started their adoption, I'd say, over the last two or three years. And, you know, like yourself, a couple of years ago, four or five years ago, I remember, you know, working in a lab and, you know, trying AI on one or two images that we could get, you know, get hold of. Now, you know, we're looking at tens, hundreds of thousands of real images being produced, and then from that producing the synthetic model algorithm. So we're starting to see the volumes of data and pathology that AI systems love as well, because of these big projects like Path Lake, Big Picture, ICAD up in Scotland, Leeds um, as well. So we're also starting to see those real patients with obviously real diseases that are going to help to inform and build these very, very large models. And, you know, this is why digital pathology is is now so exciting, but also the impact of what we could do on Cambridge One in digital pathology, pathology could be really, really quite fundamental. Yeah, it sounds like it. What kind of results are we expecting? What What's the future going to look like uh, based on all of this new capability and things we can do with supercomputers like Cambridge One? What's the different? What's the future going to look like for patients? I think it's a really good question. I what I would like to certainly see is that some of the main cancers that the algorithms that in some cases may just be constantly too big to keep on training we've got a mechanism on Cambridge One to keep those trained, keep them up to date, because of course, science is constantly moving forward. And, you know, ever more so this day and age, you know, the amount of papers that are being published all of the time, for us to keep, you know, keep on doing that as a manual, manual, you know, teaching the pathologists, the clinical teams, you know, is very, very challenging. If we can support them with some, very, you know, these algorithms that are constantly being kept up to date with the latest science, with the latest images being annotated by the latest trained pathologists or the leading, or, you know, pathologists around the world, these algorithms are going to be fundamental to clinical um, care, uh, and they're going to really enhance that process. And um, so that's one thing for Cambridge One that I think is going to be, you know, really, really kind of life changing. I think the other one is going to be the startup community. And I think we see that in pathology and other areas like drug discovery, where the startup community, because they can get, you know, they can really understand AI very quickly. They can adapt their technology very quickly and they're very nimble. They're usually quite small organizations, but sometimes they're doing amazing things. I think we can get Cambridge One and the startup community firing together. Again, we can we can accelerate the work that they want to do by bringing Cambridge One type supercomputing power to them that then brings their tools, their solutions, their assets much faster to the market rather than taking you know years doing that in months. That helps with things like seed funding, um, but also you know puts their solutions into the hands of the clinical teams much much faster as well. So I think there's the you know the clinical community working on these big clinical projects and programs, but I think there's also that startup community which is so innovative at the moment in the UK. It's absolutely fascinating how fast that's been driven, but also around the world we're seeing that in the US. You know, in many places, Paris, Berlin, Stockholm, Oslo, you know, there's a real kind of interest now in the startup community. So I think that's the other area that I really see Cambridge One and the kind of transition into AI. Yeah, there certainly is. I think these new technologies 
are certainly fostering a, a very unique uh, ecosystem among startups. We're certainly seeing that in, in digital pathology. I think the world's becoming smaller, right? That we're <laughs> yeah. seeing, you know, these great startups from all corners of the world, but able to make solutions that that are usable across the across the world. I think it's 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 fantastic. So let's bring it back to home or back to your home. Uh, let's talk about. AI applications in digital pathology right now in the UK in particular, we know the NHS has made massive investments in digital pathology. What would you say is the current state of AI implementation in clinical practice in the UK in in pathology? And what, what do these workflows look like? I think we are still at the early phases, even in the UK. I think we Digital pathology, the devices and the processes and procedures around those devices have been implemented and they're now up and running. So again, if we look at the work going on at Leeds or at ICAD or at Park Lake, we've seen the actual devices themselves get implemented. I think what we're starting to see now across a number of clinical areas, as I explained earlier, areas like lung cancer, colorectal cancer, images start to um, come into some of the central systems. I think now is a really, really important time. And the reason why is because what we must ensure is that that data is fit for purpose for the AI system. And that's really important. We want the data fit for purpose. We want it well annotated. We want any metadata that we can possibly can to be associated with that image so that when it we come to use it for AI, um, we don't have to retrofit things like the annotation, things like the metadata, things like the interoperability with the patient record system. So I think that to me, that's a really important phase next to make sure we've got all of that right. And then once we've got that right, let's open the floodgates and get those images into you know, the cent central imaging systems or the federated imaging systems so that we can start to build up um, big portfolios of images that obviously all of these AI systems love to have. You know, the more images that we've got, the much better that we have. So I think it's still really early days, but it, you know, it really looks like this is going to be a really interesting area. And I think pathology and AI go fantastically well together. But also when we look at the area like genomics and pathology and genomics coming together and the use of AI in both of those disciplines, that's when we start to really talk about precision medicine. And we've been talking about this for 20 plus years and still we can't really say that we've, we, you know, we've accomplished it in any great way. That's true. We, the, the buzzwords are flying around everywhere, personalized medicine, precision yeah. medicine. And it seems to me, you know, one of the barriers is silos, right? We have all this great information that is powerful, useful, or, or at the very least significant. Uh, we know genomics play a large role. We know the features in histologic images play a role in patient care. There's information in radiology, but putting it all together I think has been a challenge. I mean, maybe because of, you know, just lacking the resources to put things together in one place, uh, lacking an approach for multimodalities. How will we be able to to bring this this disparate data together? Is it is it a matter of computing power? So like Cambridge One being able to create synthetic patient avatars, synthetic images, is it really just a numbers game? You know, what what's really been the barrier to precision medicine? I think it's a really good question. I, I, I totally agree. I, I think I remember HIMSS conferences 20 years ago where everybody used the word precision or personalized medicine on every single billboard um, or you know, organization. That was their kind of strap line. And then if you really looked into it, none of them would, were really doing it. I think the challenge has been the data. I think, you know, if you look at digital pathology, we're only just starting to churn through the data and get the data and get the data fit for purpose. That Again, going back to that key point, get it well annotated, get the metadata alongside it. I think genomics has really not accelerated fast enough. I don't think we've, you know, we've, we've seen great programs like Genomics England and the UK Biobank but I just don't think we've had enough of them that are being really used for clinical care rather than for research. So I think 
the availability of data in the way that AI needs it has just not been there. But I think that's changing. And I think we're on the cusp of a, a kind of a new data revolution where we're, we're seeing things like long read sequencing um, from people like Oxford Nanopore, you know, create masses of sequence data. We're seeing the digital pathology programs creating lots and lots of, as I was saying before, tens of thousands, soon to be hundreds of thousands of images. These are kind of the, the kind of paradigms that are coming together. And I think this is where we'll start to really look at areas like multi-omics, personalized medicine, and actually NVIDIA, a lot of the conversations we're getting in together now is, we don't just want to do pathology, but we want to do pathology and we want to do that with genetics. How can we do that together? So that's on the horizon for the work that we're doing. Again, we are very, very early days in this. I do hope GPUs um, will help to accelerate the ability to analyze, you know, tens of thousands of pathology images, as well as tens of thousands of genomics images and look for commonalities, look from a pathology image, dive straight into the genetic DNA data, look for the particular marker, and then start to be able to inform each other. So I think I think we are going to see a revolution in the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah, a revolution. Put put it. Let's put it all together and make make personalized medicine a reality rather than just talk. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, indeed. So Craig Rhodes from Nvidia, thank you so much for being with us. Now, on a personal note, maybe tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. How did you get interested in uh, supercomputing and digital pathology? I've been working in digital pathology for quite a few years, actually. I started many years ago working with GSK um, when I was with another organization. But when I moved to NVIDIA, it was one of the areas that we we thought this should be really good for GPUs. This is a These are very, very big images. They're very, very complex. They have multi-layers. This must be a big challenge. You know, one of the best things about M NVIDIA is they want to do the really hard stuff. So if you go to our head of healthcare, Kimberly Powell, she will she loves these kind of challenges and these problems. And digital pathology and pathology is an enormous problem for any compute to digest, understand, and then determine. So you know, those are the kind of areas that um, we at NVIDIA like, and especially our healthcare team. So it's it's been something that I've been interested in for the last 10 years. 10 years ago, we were probably looking at one image and spending weeks trying to analyze that single image, whilst uh, some of the customers we were working with tapping their fingers. Now we're, you know, we're in the realms of 10,000, 100,000 images and looking to churn through them in maybe days. So, you know, the, the world has changed and shifted and NVIDIA has been on that wave and has driven that wave of change. And I think this is, for me, what is personally fascinating is how, our, how NVIDIA has really uh, kind of adopted some of these big, really large data sets in the healthcare industry and really shown, you know, how we can um, analyze them, how we can, you know, bring identify new data from them that could never be identified. When we look at the old world of looking down a glass slide and trying to determine what was going on, and now the new world, they, they, they're so far apart, but they're still the same thing. You know, you're still looking at a very, very similar sort of image. So I just find it enormously fascinating. And the team that we have here at NVIDIA, just uh, they eat up this kind of problem. <laughs> the world the world has changed indeed and i think like you said the the new way of doing things is seems a long way away from the old way of doing things <laughs> yeah indeed what is this new world going to look like in the next 10 years or so real quick yeah so i i really do think you know we talked a bit about precision medicine personalized medicine i really hope before i retire i am going to see some glimmers of light of the ability to take the pathology, the genetics, the electronic healthcare record data, and start to really make better recommendations of the patient care, the drug protocols, and the drugs um, for the patient to have. I think also this ability to accelerate artificial intelligence into clinical care as well. How can we ensure that the adoption can be done 
faster, quicker, but also ensuring the right ethical and security requirements are complied to as well. So I, th I think the world has to change with AI. And it, it will be, it's going, to, I think just the next, we've really set it up well. We're, we're kind of at this marker point, And I think you said reflection point, And I really think we're there. But I think this next three to five years will really determine, have we really got it right? Yeah. Have we really got it right? I hope so. <laughs> Our guest has been uh, Craig Rhodes from NVIDIA. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. This has been Digital Pathology Today. Please be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening.